Okay, welcome everybody uh, to AI Agent Building, or uh, as we know, a bit south of the border, AI Agent Building. Um, I want to start with a question and just ask, um, who has made a website chatbot before the emergence of large language models and, and AI in its current incantation? Okay, and um, who's made one since? Okay, and who talked a client out of making a chatbot before? <laughs> And who's now tried to change, who's changed position and now tried to talk that client back into uh, now needing a chatbot? So this is a, a fairly common thing, I think. Uh, you know, we've come a long way in a couple of years and um, I'm hoping to show you some, some interesting techniques here as to um, how you can make these yourselves um, and uh, using a set of open source tools and, and services and uh, complement your Drupal sites with them. So uh, this is just an example of a classic Canadian agent building workshop using advanced equipment. Clearly people know who, who know how to ski, <laughs> know how to stand on skis at least, and a kind of a bunch of sort of weird creatures in the background that I'm not quite sure what they are. But <laughs> okay, so um, my name's Greg Coppin. I'm a web developer and uh, d designer and consultant. Um, I operate out of Nelson, BC, um, up in the mountains. I've been working with Drupal for 16 years, and over the last year or two, I've been um, working more with uh, building out AI agents for different clients and um, consulting on strategy around how to set them up, and uh, particularly in the education space, um, nonprofits, businesses, e-commerce. So it's uh, fairly new to me, but I feel like I've, I've been getting a good handle on the tool set, and um, I'd love to share some of that with you guys today. Okay, so. It, it, it's a good place to start with what is an AI agent. And um, so it's a software entity that autonomously performs tasks on behalf of a user or another program. Okay, so uh, we're going to be aiming to actually build one in this session. So it's going to be um, sort of part theory, uh, part practical. And um, the one that we're planning to build is going to actually be, oh, sorry, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. But um, before we, we do, let's just have a quick review of where AI is in Drupal 11 currently. Um, so I'm sure um, some of you might have seen the Dries note from the most recent DrupalCon, and there's some really exciting uh, AI development starting to happen in the Drupal project, um, in particularly in Drupal 11 and the Starshot initiative. So uh, while a lot of this is at a demo stage, uh, these base modules are actually available already, and um, by some accounts though they're not quite ready to go, so I think the tools I'm going to show you are going to, to be a good uh, supplement until uh, these are production ready. So the main uh, improvements uh, that, that have uh, been announced um, ha have been in the case of uh, AI website assistance, uh, similar to something that we're going to build today. Um, but now this would be within the Drupal project. There is an a, a, a AI project and an AI agents project. The AI agents project is currently used by one website, so I'm not too sure if I'd recommend using it just yet. Um, but basically, uh, this is going to provide an assistant for your end user you know, answering questions based on the content that uh, your, your Drupal site has. Uh, so that's going to be basically using a RAG model, but you're not going to be needing any external tools. Uh, eventually, this will be dealt with entirely internally within Drupal. So um, the uh, second one is the AI-assisted site building, which is uh, very interesting sounding. Um, basically, that's a little chatbot in the corner for site builders which allows you to say, you know, hey, I need this content type with these fields, uh, add a taxonomy, um, populate it with these terms, and you know, so suddenly building a Drupal site is going to be something you can do on the phone while driving, and um, it's going to okay. probably make a lot of our lives quite a bit easier. Uh, then we have sort of AI-driven personalization, which is going to be, you know, much more powerful recommendation engines. Based on the articles you read, or based on the products you looked at, you know, what else are you likely to enjoy uh, from that site's current content? Um, then one that's pretty exciting, I think, to anyone who's ever dealt with the migration in Drupal is um, AI-assisted content migrations. And, um, you know, this, this takes one of the more painful parts and, and, and turns it into something that, uh, in light of the demo anyway, that looks like it's going to be really straightforward to do. So this would involve uh, pointing the agent at um, the site that you're wanting to import, and uh, it would be smart enough to analyze what content types you would need, what fields you would need, what taxonomies you would need, and then takes over that um, migration component. So, you know, it might be more practical and simpler sites than, than really complex ones, but any assistance in, in this area is going to be welcomed. 
So for content authors, uh, we were going to have things like um, automated tagging based on the content, um, alt tags that are generated based on the images that are being updated, that are being um, added, um, and also enhanced AI content creation. So you know, let me help you summarize this. Uh, let me rewrite this for you. And you know, so I think these are some of the, the AI developments that we can see will be eventually baked into the Drupal project. And um, you know, so there's exciting times ahead with this, but. As I said in the earlier, it's a, it's a little way off still, and so um, you know, I'm going to show you a set of tools that you can use right now, and uh, be, be doing a lot of this sort of similar stuff, in particular the first one, building a, a RAG-based uh, website assistant, um, using open source tools and, and uh, services. Okay, so our objective in this session, and it's a little bit of an optimistic one, I'm really hoping we're going to get all the way through it, but is that we're going to be building a, PNW, a Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit conference assistant. So we're going to go through the process of uh, training this assistant uh, on the current website. Um, we're going to go through the process of chunking up that data and embedding it um, in a vector database. And finally, at uh, uh, testing and giving our chatbot a little bit of personality. So let's get started. Okay, so a couple of theory things we just want to get out the way first is like, I'm not too sure that this session was sort of aimed at all levels of experience. So I just wanted to introduce the idea of, of uh, a large language model, to, uh, if anyone doesn't know what this is yet. Um, it's a type of artificial intelligence that's been trained to understand and generate human language. Okay, so this is done by uh, being trained on, on large data sets and um, uh, learning how it learns how words and sentences are structured and how they relate to each other. And when given a prompt or question, it can use what it's learned to generate a cohesive response. So I like to think of this as the base cake. Um, this is your, your chocolate or your vanilla or your strawberry sponge cake. And um, you know, at this level, uh, you know, this is going to be useful in a general context like a chat GPT where you can ask it anything. But this is not going to be useful in your localized website context of where you only want it to answer questions based on your website. Um, you don't want people burning your chat GPT tokens um, using it through your website. So um, uh, the other thing is these large language models are very expensive to train, which is why there's only um, a handful of them out there and they are made by big companies with big budgets and, and uh, you know, they're very uh, resource and energy intensive to, to create. So what we're going to be looking at doing is providing a fine tuning layer on top of this sponge cake. And so I like to think of this as the icing and the cherries and the sprinkles and um, you know, so fine tuning is about taking a general purpose model and making it, uh, turning it into a more specialized model based on, on, on your content. So one of the most valuable things that this does um, is it creates a boundary around what the chatbot can and can't answer information on. So, um, you know, as an example, um, if you were to not have a specialized model, it's going to answer a, a question on anything. Uh, once it's been trained on your data, we can tell it, hey, if you don't know the answer, don't answer, you know, say you don't know. So, you know, this drastically limits uh, the sort of liability associated with having a chatbot that's going to answer everything. And when it doesn't know the question, it's going to make it up. So, long story short, this is going to reduce or uh, uh, remove hallucinations altogether from your localized chatbots. Okay, so there's two main um, ways we're going to do this. Uh, the first is through a, um, a process called prompt engineering. And um, I like to think of this as what we're going to do to give our chatbot some personality. So we're going to be crafting a specific input prompt designed to guide the model towards generating assisted outputs. Okay, so it's a little bit of a dry way of saying, you know, we're going to tell it how it must act, um, how it must respond, what it should say, what it shouldn't say, and, um, you know, we're going to give it some general fine tuning based on that. Okay, the second level of fine tuning that we're going to be looking at and this is the more uh, complex one, is um, to use a retrieval augmented generation uh, method. So you might have heard of this acronym uh, been mentioned around chatbots before. It's called, uh, you know, it's known as RAG. And basically this is going and saying, hey, you know, we know that you know everything about everything and you can answer questions on all of that, but we only want you to answer questions based on this data set which we've provided you with. So with the combination of prompt engineering and the specialized training, we're going to give this chatbot a, a nice tight boundary to work within and um, be able to answer your questions meaningfully based on your content. The cherries on top, as such. Okay, so I remember 20 years ago when I was a young developer writing average code that I really appreciated software with an intuitive UI. 
So lots have changed since then. I'm now an older developer, still writing average code and appreciating an awesome UI even more. <laughs> so in that context, um, FlowWise is the tool that we're going to be using as the sort of heartbeat of the operation here. Um, it's an open source, um, user-friendly, no-code platform. Um, it's built on top of Langchain, which is a, a well-established framework for building um, applications around uh, based on large language models. Um, what's really cool about this is that uh, FlowWise being the sort of really quick to prototype and, and build out ideas with um, uh, uh, UI, um, that that can really uh, have a good shift towards a, a full production version written solely in code um, at the end of the day, uh, if needed. Um, another powerful thing about FlowWise is that um, you can use it to handle the whole process from ingesting through to uh, providing your chatbot interface, or you can use it to, uh, for just parts of the pipeline uh, that you, you need it for. So, we're going to be uh, using it selectively, but I'm going to show you how you know you would be able to kind of use it for, for all of those aspects too. Um, and oh, I didn't start the timer. Okay, <laughs> right. So um, uh, the other awesome thing about um, Flowwise that can't be understated is the uh, fact that it now supports multi-agent networks. So we'll have a little bit of a demonstration as to what that means a little bit later on, but it's a, it's a really powerful uh, concept. Okay. Oh, yes. Were you supposed to hit that button? I'm sorry, say again? Did you start it? Were you supposed to hit that? I, I did start it, yes, thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I forgot to start the timer, though. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go through briefly what this retrieval augmented generation pipeline looks like. Okay, so on the far left-hand side, we've got our data connection, our source. So in this case, this is going to be our Drupal site. In this case, the Pacific Northwest Drupal site. Um, you know, there are various ways to ingest this data. We'll go through that in a little bit. But um, the one that I'm going to suggest is, as, the, as the most powerful is to actually use an external service called API Fire, um, which I'll demonstrate to you shortly. So what we're going to be doing is loading this data from our website. And we're going to be transforming it because you know pages and pages of data are not that helpful to our chatbot. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to chunk it up into lots of little pieces, and uh, so that's the transformation stage. And we're going to then be conf uh, we're going to then be um, going through an embed process, which is going to be converting this content and its relationships into vector arrays, which we're then going to be storing in a vector database, which we're going to be using Pinecone for. And finally, this is what our chatbot's going to be talking to, to be able to respond really quickly with, with uh, answers um, to questions uh, from our content. Um, and, uh, you know, using these vector arrays uh, is way quicker than it's ever going to be trying to find a keyword going through a huge data set. So, um, let's see how this works. Okay, so there's several different ways we can get our data from a Drupal site. Um, the one that I tend to prefer for most um, use cases actually at this point is just scraping the pages directly. Uh, there's a couple of reasons for this that, that we'll go into, um, but uh, really one of the most important is that it, it retains the content structure. Um, so if you have links in a page, uh, if you have images in a page, uh, you know, as long as we're converting that to markdown format, uh, we can actually retain those links and images uh, within our chatbot context, which is a, a really powerful thing. Of course, there might be areas of the, uh, you know, you don't want to do a giant 5,000 page scrape every time the website gets updated or on too much of a regular basis. So there might be areas like, let's say, your news and events that you want the chatbot to be up to date with, but uh, those could be then being supplied through a, a Drupal Core API, um, like the, using JSON API and being able to query your content directly. Um, and, you know, that's where you could be hitting that three times a day or once a day or whatever it is to be getting updated content and adding that to your training set so that that chatbot is, is current on your website without needing to go through a giant scrape every time. Um, Drupal views with REST exports. So this is a really powerful way for us to make custom endpoints um, that can speak directly to the chatbot, giving it just the information that we want it to. Um, this is a really powerful method, actually, and combine that with Search API and Apache Solar, and in particular, Apache Solar Search API attachments, which is quite a mouthful, but we can now be serving up content that's stored deep within the bowels of our site um, in the form of PDFs or Word documents or things like that. So in particular, I've had success with this on a, a large uh, school district site, that multi-site that I manage, which has 22 associated schools. And like any uh, educational institution, there is a huge amount of knowledge <laughs> locked away in PDFs. 
policy information, uh, minutes of meetings, um, all kinds of stuff where if you wanted to find that usually, what you would need to do is search for the, that file on the website, eventually find the file, open the file, search within the file to find what it is. And so now uh, this gives you the capability to be able to just actually um, query, you know, ask the question, uh, policy related, you know, um, you know, what's the school dress code or something like that, and it can answer you right from the home page and, and link you to the relevant policy document. So this is a, a really powerful concept, especially when you apply it to, um, you know, any sort of government websites. Um, a lot of nonprofits too also have a lot of really valuable content uh, deeply buried in PDFs, and so this is a, a, a great way to surface some of that really important content. And um, I do just have a little example. Oh, oh no, it's going to do it on the wrong one. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, let me just get over to here. Um, okay, one second. I do have an example of what this kind of JSON output looks like, if I can get my cursor. <laughs> Copy that. Um, just so you can get a sense for what that looks like. So, you know, here, here is an example. We, we, um, you know, it's in a nice structured uh, JSON format. It's giving us a link to where on the school site that that specific handout is. And then it's actually just got all of the content from within that PDF exposed as plain text um, that we can now chunk up and use to help train our chatbots. So um, it's, a, it's a really uh, valuable thing and uh, it can't be overstated. Okay, so there are some provisios with data scraping in particular. Um, we all know the, the saying garbage in, garbage out. And you, know, you are going to find that there are certain things that we want to be doing to manipulate and sanitize that data before it goes into our training stage. So one of the big things is duplication. If we've got the same question um, and it's answered across a website five or six different times and each one is a slightly different answer, maybe like getting you know, with one that's the modern new correct answer and then five outdated ones, and we feed all of those into the training, our chatbot's not going to know which one is the correct answer. So, you know, it's quite likely could respond with an outdated response. Um, so this kind of confusion, I think, actually is a lack of context for the, for the chatbot to know exactly what it is that it should be responding to and, um, you know, can, can make for some sort of muddy results. So one of the key things we want to do there is we want to try and remove any duplication at the source. The other thing which absolutely cripples um, a training data set is uh, embedded base64 images or SVG files. Um, it turns out feeding a giant string of random numbers uh, into an embedding process to turn into a giant string of random numbers is just not going to end well. And in fact, up to like one embedded image can really be the end of your data set. So, um, you know, we want to make sure that we can kind of extract and strip that stuff out nicely uh, before we get uh, too far into it. Um, and the other thing is, you know, if we're just doing a straight scrape, uh, often we're going to be losing a lot of our content structure. Things like links are not going to be retained if it's all in plain text. Um, you know, same with images. Uh, so we're going to be losing a lot of like the real rich metadata that, that's part of that content and that's very valuable for us in the, the context of our chatbot. So let's look at some ways in which we can mitigate this. And um, I'm going to introduce you to a tool now called API-Fi. Um, it's a website, it's a commercial software as a service. Uh, you get five hours free, which is actually quite a lot. Um, and it allows us to kind of deal with a lot of these sort of scraping issues and, and manipulation issues. Um, so let's just go in and have a quick look and we can kind of show you exactly how it works. Okay, so you can see here we've basically started a task. We're using an actor called the Website Content Crawler. Um, within API files context, uh, they have various actors that can do different things. You have ones that can scrape Instagram specifically, or uh, LinkedIn profiles, or you know different kinds of scrapers uh, for all different kinds of purposes. Um, but in this case, all we're going to be doing is feeding it this single link, this uh, PNW Drupal Summit link. Um, we're going to be telling it um, that we want to be crawling to a depth of uh, three three links uh, deep. And a, a couple of really useful things that this is going to do for us that, you know, just using Flowwise's built-in scrapers, which, sorry, I haven't actually mentioned yet, Flowwise does have a Puppeteer, um, a Playwright, a Cheerio, like it's got a few scrapers that you can use directly within its interface, 
but you don't get any of this goodness from it. And so that's why I'm, I'm going to recommend instead of, and unless it's a very simple website or a very simple training set, um, something like API Fi is going to add a lot of value to, to your workflow. So we can see one of the things we're doing here is it's stripping out things like the navigation, the footer, um, you know, it's stripping out any alerts, it, like things that are not really going to be relevant to our training data. It's basically stripping out before we train. So that's great. We're not going to have the navigation 20 times for the footer and the header, you know, that we're now going to have to try and figure out how to, how to deduplicate. So right out the gate, this gives us some, some nice um, benefits there. And um, we can see it's also expanding um, any kind of uh, um, uh, clickable elements. So stuff that's collapsed in, in um, you know, like uh, in frame sets and stuff, uh, you're not going to be able to view normally if you're just scraping the, the page without that. So this is actually going to go and open that frame set and then uh, be able to pull that, uh, that content out. So this outputs to, uh, and oh, very importantly, and this is almost a good enough reason to use this right out the gate, is that it converts this content to markdown. And so this is so important because it preserves our links, which means that we've got something very valuable as another kind of search engine within our site. Um, okay, so I have run this already just to, to speed things up a little bit. Um, and so if we have a look at the runs here, we'll see it, uh, it got 107 requests. And here is the chunks of data that it, it extracted. And um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to hand it over to another actor. And this one is called our merge, dedupe, and transform. Okay, so this is going to be doing something really important for us. And basically, uh, so what I've done is, uh, so just to, sorry, to fill in a little missing gap there, um, basically that scraped set goes to this data set. And um, this data set right out the, out the gate is accessible as a API now for us that we can use to scrape, okay? But you can see it's, it's fairly uh, verbose. It's got lots of uh, other elements in it. And, um, you know, we haven't really done any sanitizing on it yet. So any uh, embedded images or anything like that is going gonna, is gonna to make things fall over. Um, okay. So uh, what we're next going to do is we're going to go and open uh, our uh, merge dedupe. So I'm going to go to save tasks. And, um, and so this is looking at that data set. Um, again, it's going to be now running a deduplication on our markdown field. So any duplicate data, it's going to be stripping out. Very importantly, too, and I said this was no code. It's certainly low code. We're running a little bit of JavaScript here that's basically just going to strip out any base 64 encoded um, images. It's going to strip out any SVGs that are embedded. And it's going to inject a little bit of useful metadata, a source website there, which we're going to be able to use in FlowWise to identify where this training data is coming from. Okay, so... Um, we are going to um, oh, sorry that's so sorry I need to go to the set of tasks oh, was it the runs um, okay and you know what we're going to just use this one so um, so basically we can see where this has gone and this has been run and um, another interesting thing about API Fire is it spins up a Docker container or Docker containers to to do the scraping for you so. Um, you know, it's very resource effective. Um, when you have a paid plan, you know, it can do them in parallel. And, you know, so if you're doing huge scrapes, it's, it's a really uh, valuable tool for that. Um, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to um, our, sorry, not that one, our Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit clean data set. Um, and uh, so this we're going to go and have a look in a new tab. And we're going to see we've got a nice clean um, data source now. Uh, all we have is the markdown field. Uh, the relevant metadata um, and the URL that it comes from. So we're going to just go and copy and paste that. Okay. And then let's advance here. So now we're going to go over to Flowwise and we're going to have a look at our basic agent setup. Okay. So uh, welcome to Flowwise. As you can see, it's a sort of node based interface. Uh, you have a huge amount of things you can add and adjust on the left hand side here. Um, we're not going to go into too much depth in it because we've obviously got quite a short amount of time for what we're trying to achieve here. So I will just very quickly uh, take you through what these little uh, nodes that we do have set up are. So we have a chat a open, AP a open AI node. And so this is basically telling us that we're going to choose, um, you know, we're going to use ChatGPT is going to be the, the large language model that we're going to use. And as you saw there, there's um, all kinds of flavors of ChatGPT. So we're going to just use um, ChatGPT for Omni for now. Um, 
We have, uh, this is uh, the, the, the sort of the, the main node that we use for our conversational retrieval QA chain. So this is our, our actual chatbot. Um, attached it has a buffer memory. So that's just so that it can recall the conversation in the, uh, like during a session so that, um, you know, it's not um, going to be answering, uh, you know, forgetting uh, uh, who you are every time you open the same chatbot on the same website. Um, there are different kinds of memory we could use. We could be storing that in Redis. We could be storing that in, a, in, in any other kind of external database. Um, okay, so um, over here we have our Pinecone vector database. We're going to go into this in a little bit more detail in a moment. Um, and then this is fed by two things, um, a text embedding, uh, open AI embeddings, where uh, we can see here that we're using the text embedding model, um, text embedding three small. Okay, so we're going to make a mental note of that because uh, that's going to be something we're going to use when we set up the, the vector index. And finally, we have a Postgres record manager here. So this is, um, uh, this is really just to try and help us prevent duplication and allow us to kind of run incremental updates. So all that this is is it's a separate database with a flat structure that's going to be uh, storing hashed values of what's been in, uh, inserted into our vector database. So that it knows, if we rescrape the website, it's not going to need to re upsert 5,000 records, it's going to just do the new ones, it's going to delete any that have changed, and so this allows us to kind of uh, be able to, to manage incremental updates. Okay, so what we're going to be doing now is creating a data store. Okay, so let's just do a search for data store. Uh, sorry, no, actually data store is over here. Um, okay, a document store, I'm sorry. And so what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be saying, okay, this is our PNWDS... Uh, demo. Okay, and we're going to be opening this and adding a document loader. So you can see there's all different kinds of data sources you can uh, import from here, from your simple CSV files through the Figma documents through to Notion pages and databases. So, um, you know, this is one of these really powerful reasons for, for actually going down this route of using Flowwise is there's so much baked in uh, for you to get going with that, um, you know, really to, to be Researching and writing all of this yourself, it's going to take a lot longer to get up and up and running just to, to uh, proof of concept something. Okay, so we're going to be uh, loading from the, um, we're going to be using the get method. I'm going to be pasting in that API file data set that we just said there. Okay, now we talked about, um, you know, how we're going to actually uh, uh, chunk up this data because at the moment, you know, it's going to be these big blobs of information and, you know, for the embed into the vector database, it needs to be smaller chunks. So here we have a couple of different strategies for that. So um, we're going to be using the Markdown text splitter, which is going to uh, break it in semantic sort of chunks based on where headings are. So um, another uh, often used one is to actually use the recursive character text splitter. So now you can tell it, okay, every thousand characters I want you to split this chunk, but I want you to overlap the chunk with the next chunk by like 200 characters. So what this does is establish relationships between the chunks. So if, the, if an answer comes from chunk B, um, you know, it knows that the stuff in chunk A and the stuff in chunk C is quite likely related, and so it's going to kind of draw that as part of the relationships in, in that uh, vector array. Okay, so we're going to choose a uh, markdown text splitter, and again, another awesome feature here is we can actually preview what are these chunks going to look like. Okay, so we can see it's broken it down into 221 different chunks, and um, yeah, we're going to say that that's, that's good for, for what we want to do now. And uh, we're going to let that work for a moment. We just refreshed it, and we're getting the green light there, which says, okay, cool, we've now got this data set uh, that we've got from API file that's been trained on the site. Uh, we've got it chunked up and ready to go into our embedding process. So we're going to go back over to our chat flow, and we're going to add a document store. Oops. No, sorry. Uh, where is our document store? There we go. So we're going to just drag that on. Okay. We're going to go and fetch our PNWDS demo data set there. We're going to take this little node here and we're going to connect it to the document node on our Pinecone database. Okay. So now we should be almost ready to go. Okay, I'm just going to save that. We're going to go back to the presentation. And we're going to have a look through setting up the vector database. Okay, so sorry, so we've just done this. We've loaded our training data. We've cleaned it. We've added the source. We've added the document source, and we've transformed the data. Okay, so the next step we're going to want to do is make sure we've got a place to put it. 
So we're going to set up a vector database in Pinecone. And uh, bear with me on this. We're going, to go, we're going to go through a little description of what Pinecone actually is uh, and what a vector database is in just a moment. But uh, for now, we're going to just open this. Okay, and we're going to create a brand new index. And we're going to call it PNWDS demo. Okay. And so if you remember, we, uh, so we're being asked for what the dimensions and the metric is here for, for this vector database. So we're going to choose the setup by model, and we were using the text embedding three small. So we're going to go and choose that again, and we're going to set that configuration. And it's going to provision this on AWS for us. A note about Pinecone, it used to be the most expensive uh, vector database tool out there. It then went serverless and is now the cheapest. Um, in all the experimentation I've done, I think I've yet to kind of uh, like exceed a two or three dollar um, uh, 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 billable amount on it. So, um, and I should say the same about um, all of these tools actually. Uh, they're, they're, it's very uh, cheap and affordable way to get going with this stuff. It's only really when it reaches any kind of scale that you're going to be, be paying any significant amounts. And this stuff is like largely self-hostable if you... It's, it's all very self-hostable. So sorry, that was something I didn't actually mention with Flowwise, is that um, it's incredibly easy to set up locally. It's just an NPM package. It's an NPM install and an NPM run. Um, it's also got a Docker container, so it's very easy to deploy remotely too. Um, so, you know, I, I, I use fly.io for um, the remote deployments, which is a, a, a micro VM service where they, it goes to sleep um, if, and doesn't charge you if, if nobody's using it. And as soon as someone uses it, it wakes up in a few seconds and is good to go. Um, it's very scalable. It's got a lovely CLI. It's, uh, I highly recommend it. It's a very cool uh, platform. But you could do this on, on pretty much anywhere that you can, um, you, can uh, you know, host these sort of in, uh, node apps. Okay, so we've got this. Um, P, P and WDS demo uh, uh, database setup. We've got no records yet, so let's go to back to Flowwise. And um, oh. okay, well, ac actually, while we're here, and, and just before we do that, let's let's chat for a moment what what a vector database actually is. So um, we're going through this embedding model now, uh, which is is going to be doing this this cool new word you might not have heard of before. It's going to be upsetting our information into the database. So. Um, you can see there, there's an example of uh, two associated things, ferries and boats, that when they go through this embedding model, they get transformed into these, uh, array, these multi-dimensional arrays. So uh, that diagram is showing you there how you know, ships and boats in this three-dimensional space are relating quite closely to, together, whereas uh, bananas and apples and pears, um, you know, being totally unrelated to boats, are, are quite different in that sort of three-dimensional space. So, um, the fact that these are just strings of numbers it w is what allows our chatbots to be able to, uh, or agents to be able to uh, get this data so quickly and, and be able to have an almost real-time conversation with us. Well, what was that the verb again? Upsert? Upsert, that's it, yeah. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll actually do an upsert right now. <laughs> um, okay, so, so we added our document store. So I'm going over here and I'm just making sure our pinecone index um, is set to P in... Uh, Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit dash demo, okay? And so right now, this green button up here, we should be good to go. So this is going to run the upsert. And, um, you know, I should mention another awesome thing about um, Flowwise is that everything in it is, is API exposed and triggerable. So this is an example where we, if we're showing the API down there, uh, where we can get some information, where we can quite easily run this upsert on a regular basis based on a cron job or, or on a, some kind of a remote triggering task. Um, and the same uh, for the output that we're going to get from this that's based on our data. You know, we, we, could, we could just be using the API component of that. It doesn't actually have to, um, it, yeah, it doesn't actually have to uh, have, use the interface that Flowwise gives you. You can be feeding this now into your custom um, React interface or whatever it is and uh, you know, be, be just using this as a data source. Okay, so there we can see our upset was uh, uh, successful, and we can see it, it added 221 chunks. Um, it didn't update any, it didn't skip any, and it didn't delete any. So because of that uh, Postgres database, the record uh, manager that we have on the side, that's sort of keeping track of these 221 items now. So let's say there was some content that was then uh, deleted off the website, um, and we reran the scrape, and um, you know, then we rerun. Uh, like so, this is the beauty too. If the, the scrape gets rerun. Let's say you could you could also schedule that to happen once a day or once every two days, um, and then 
that's be, being now an API that is going to automatically update here. And then if this is on a scheduled upset, like if there's changes made to the site, they're going to automatically be reflected through to here and uh, elements would get deleted or elements would get added. Um, so there is, this is quite a nice automatable process to be able to, to put this on a schedule as opposed to need to manually run it each time. Okay, so if we don't believe it, we can always go over to our Pinecone database and there we can now see we've got 221 records in there. Um, if you're curious to see what these records look like in terms of their storage, this is what the, one of those multi-dimensional um, uh, uh, database arrays looks like. Um, it's quite a mouthful. It's not really super human friendly, but um, you know it's very chatbot friendly, and, and that's what they like to work on. So, okay. Oh, I think. Oh, sorry, there we go. Okay, so uh, now we're going to go and give it a little bit of personality. We're going to do a bit of testing, and I'm going to show you a couple of the really cool feedback uh, uh, tools that are within FlowWise. Um, and also how we can uh, get this onto a remote website um, and add some, bra some branding and some theming and that kind of thing. So, how are we doing? Okay. Uh, right, so I'm just going to save that. And over here, the little purple thing, we're going to actually just maybe make it a little bit bigger so that we can see it clearly. So now we can ask it, okay, so can you tell me about the conference? Okay, so it tells me the conference is called the PNW Drupal Summit, a three-day event featuring insightful sessions. If you'd like more information, feel free to ask. So it's showing us great. It's working in our training data. This is the first step we need to confirm, but it's like it's pretty boring. You know, it's not really kind of giving any sort of flavor there. It's not like you know, it's not being helpful. It's just kind of giving us the info. So let's ask another question. Like, uh, what sessions on AI are there? Okay, so it's given there a link to the session. Um, it's it's perhaps incorrectly or, or maybe correctly. I'm, oh, there we go. It says which may relate to AI applications um, in the automate the little things uh, session. So it's making some inferences there, and um, you know, it's, you can see because we use the markdown, there the links are directly to the stuff in the website. So you know, clicking on one of those now is going to take us to that person's profile, and so you know, already we're seeing some value from this. But now let's look at how we can kind of juice it up just a little bit more. Okay, uh, so the first thing we're going to want to look at is changing our chatbot prompt. Chatbot prompt. <laughs> so you can see right here, this is where we've gone and this is where our actual info is on uh, how the chatbot should behave. So you are a helpful website assistant that should answer questions based on your training. Be polite and courteous and friendly. Okay, pretty generic, pretty bland. It's doing that, but you know, it's not really going out of its way to be helpful. So now I'm going to show you something that's like another one of these very big advantages as to why FlowWise is a tool you really uh, I highly recommend that you look at. And also is going to give a very quick demonstration of something uh, called the multi-agent network. Is we're now going to use a built-in um, template. So I'm, I haven't mentioned that yet, but FlowWise also comes preloaded with a whole ton of awesome templates. So to get going on some of this stuff, uh, you know, you just literally you can start a template, uh, add your own credentials, and start to experiment. Uh, we'll have a little look at, at what some of the templates are, but this uh, was really mind-blowing when I found this, and, and um, I'm the, like, I'll never handwrite a prompt again. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a prompt engineering team. So we have a supervisor over here, that's the boss. And the boss is now speaking to the prompt creator and says, you are a prompt engineer. Your job is to craft system prompts for AI agents based on user requests. And it gives an example of uh, the kind of prompt that I want you to do. But it's not good enough to just have a prompt engineer. There's got to be a reviewer to make sure that the prompt engineer is on task, right? So now when the prompt engineer is done, and if we look at the end of this prompt, it should say something like that. Um, you know, when you're ready, hand it over to the... Let's just see how big this actually is. Um, so, uh, okay, those are examples of the prompts. And when you're ready, hand it over to the reviewer to review. Okay, I'm not going to scan through all of that to find that, but I'm sure it's in there. <laughs> um, okay, and so then the prompt reviewer says, you are a meticulous and insightful AI specializing in reviewing and enhancing custom prompts. Okay, so now we've got a team that's ready to help us make, give, give our chatbot some personality. Okay, so I've copied and pasted a little like this. So pre-learning about this feature, this was what my prompts would look like. Um, 
I want to create, uh, you are an assistant for the Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit. It should be, you should be geared towards helping conference attendees uh, decide on sessions and find out information about the conference venue and associated events. So that would have been the length of my prompt. So I'm going to just copy that in there. And um, we're going to give this to the team and let them uh, work out a proper prompt for us. Okay, so something I just want to point out here as we watch this work. Um, what we're seeing here is a, um, is this sort of development view. And, um, come on, Let's just check here, it should be, um, okay, it seems to be thinking a little bit longer than it usually does, um, but, uh, barring that this works, um, what we should see is the supervisor say, hey, we've got a prompt for you, hands it over, we see the prompt engineer work out what it should be. And then the prompt engineer calls the, uh, the, the, the reviewer, and the reviewer says, hey, it's good, but you, know, you need to change this word. If you change this, it should be better, and, and you know, make some corrections. And then it gives you what your finished prompt is with the review at the end of it. And um, let me just save and refresh this page just to see if there's a timeout issue happening there. Um, just paste that again and see. OK, there we go. So the supervisor says, right, create that initial prompt. Let's just make this full screen. Oh, come on. OK, so it hands it over. Uh, the task has been complete. Um, OK, wait, sorry. So uh, supervisor says, right, like prompt's ready. Uh, review it now. Hands it over to the prompt reviewer. The prompt reviewer says, great. So now we've got like a much better prompt looking here, like, Welcome to the Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit. As a dedicated website assistant, your primary objective is to enhance the experience of conference attendees, blah, blah, blah. Uh, these are your responsibilities. Conference overview, venue information, associated events. Uh, here are some guidelines. Here's the output expectations. Uh, so this just shows you that there's a lot more to kind of generating a, a good prompt than sort of, you know, just writing a paragraph of what you think it should do. Um, and so then, uh, basically, then this is the reviewer saying, hey, I'm going to change some things. I uh, gave it a more concise name for clarity. I broke down the primary objective into clear sections. I added a separate section for guidelines to emphasize the importance of using verified information. Uh, I clarified the expected output. And so then the supervisor says, great, it's been through the team, and this is what the end thing is. So uh, the agent name is now going to be called the Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit Assistant. And we're going to go and, and just copy this. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to get the review guidelines in there too. It's just, uh, there we go. Okay, so we're going to copy that. And now it's as simple as going back over to our agent and saying, great, um, thanks for your help, prompt engineer, engineer team. Um, let's go to our demo and let's go to our additional parameters and let's just paste it in place here. Oh, so actually, ah, very importantly, I don't want to just paste it in place because there's some aspects of this I do still need to remember. So. I'm just going to replace my prompt here with its full prompt. Okay, so the important thing to still keep in here is when you do not know the answer to a question, just say, I'm going to have to think about that, but I don't know the answer currently. That could also say, uh, you know, please email this address to get uh, an answer to your question. It could also, uh, using custom tools uh, within Flowwise, it could also link in with your Microsoft Teams or your Slack channel and say, hey, there's someone on the website, the chatbot doesn't know the answer to this. Do you want me to patch them through, basically? And then you can be just using your Slack interface to now carry on that conversation direct with that person. So FlowWise is incredibly powerful in that it integrates with all kinds of different external um, uh, elements. It could automatically trigger email to be sent to say, hey, the, someone just asked this question. Uh, please, would you get back to them via email? You know? So um, yeah, so it's a really powerful thing. Uh, the other important thing to keep in here is this context um, uh, keywords, uh, that, this context in, in curly brackets. Because what that's going to be doing is saying, hey, don't forget, you only need to answer questions based on this context. If you don't know, you don't know. OK. Can I ask a question? Yes, sure. So don't you, you need two prompts, right? Don't you need one prompt to get the context of it? Absolutely, yes. And, and uh, thank sorry. you for bringing that up. I was just going to mention this. Oh, this, this No, it's, it's fine. Um, uh, 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 so I just want to mention this previous one that we see here called the rephrase prompt. So what this is going to do is basically say, hey, Take everything that's been asked before this qu prompt 
and jam it in in front of it so that there's a memory of what's what's been talked about so far. So that's how you can say, uh, you know, tell me about this session, and then you can say what time is it, and it'll know that you're talking about that session that you just asked about because it sort of plugs in the history. So you know, it's it's a, it, you don't see the rephrase prompt that is kind of invisible uh, uh, being being added in front of yours. But um, thank you for pointing that out. Very importantly, that that does give us that historical context. Okay, so now let's try and and and, and ask it a similar kind of question. Let's just start from scratch there again. And let's say, um, you know, uh, tell me about the conference. Okay, so you see now we're getting a whole bunch more information. Well, it's sessions and workshops, it's prominent speakers, it's networking opportunities. So tell me about the social events. Okay, so it, it's kind of giving us a much more detailed response than it did before. Now, you know, we, we've chosen to not give it a whole ton of extra personality. We want it to just be still courteous, polite, and to the point. But you could now plug in there and speak like a pirate, you know, and <laughs> give it whatever kind of extra personality you want, and it's going to, to be doing that. So, um, you know, we could also ask it things in context, like um, what sessions are currently on? Well. 1.30 to 2.30. Okay, maybe it didn't get that one. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, you know, we could also say, uh, are there any, any theming sessions? Okay, great. There's Andrew's one popped up at the top there. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so, so there, there we go. It's pulling out the, the, the two uh, theming-related uh, sessions. And as we can see, it's giving a lot of extra detail on them, which is great. Okay, real world now. Um, we're going to want some form of testing this. We're going to want some form of um, people being able to say, hey, uh, those aren't sessions that are going on now. Bad answer. Sorry. You know, and we need some kind of feedback here, right? Like, so we have a couple of ways to do this. And... Uh, you know, it, I don't quite understand why this is so deeply hidden within the, the, the FlowWise interface, but this is some of the most powerful features of FlowWise and that we're going to have a quick look at right here. So the first, rate limiting. Okay, we can enable, like, hey, don't let anyone spam the bot. If they've asked their 10 questions in 10 minutes, you know, cut them off until it's time for, you know, until a, a set amount of time, and then uh, you, they can ask more questions. Um, Starter prompts. So, you know, a la chat GPT, you know, you can start with a couple of like, tell me about the conference or what events are there, what social events are there, and kind of give a user a couple of initial prompts so that they can get going if they don't know what to say out the gate or what to ask for out the gate. Okay, follow up prompts. This is super cool. Um, and I'm just going to go and quickly enable this. And this is the other cool thing with. Uh, um, so you add all your credentials to, to FlowWise, and then you can just re-reference them as you need. Um, so basically, I'm going to just save this at its defaults, and we'll have a look at what that is. But firstly, this is a great uh, testing tool. Um, and secondly, this is a great tool as to like helping your user like figure out what to ask next. So if you've just asked about theming sessions, it might also say, um, hey, do you want to know about the theming birds of a feather that's going to be set up? Or um, you know, do you want to be linked with the person giving the theming sessions? Or, so as we'll see in a moment, this kind of provides like a little bit of prompting. You know, it's like sort of using AI to prompt the, you using the AI. So there's a lot of like inception type things that sort of start to happen here, but it's, uh, it's, it's pretty powerful. Um, speech to text, okay, so uh, this, I, I, it doesn't work wonderfully yet. It will one day. Uh, it does enable a little microphone that allows you to ask your question directly to the chatbot. It records it as a little MP3, and then it responds. It's not very fluid. If you've used uh, ChatGPT's advanced mo advanced voice mode yet, it's nothing like that. Um, it's sort of much closer to like when voice first came into ChatGPT. Um, having said that, um, OpenAI have now announced that open voice mode and real-time uh, conversation is going to be something that they're releasing through the API. It's going to be something that we're going to be able to access. And you know that's the beauty of using a, a open source tool like FlowWise and and um, and a framework like Langchain is that it's super actively developed and literally every time you run an update on this, you're kind of seeing a bunch of new templates, a bunch of new features. Like uh, this follow-up prompts, you know, wasn't there yesterday or two days ago. Now it's there and it's and it's amazing. So you know it's a great way to kind of be able to uh, sort of 
uh, keep up with some of these developments without having to be coding them all yourself or, or you know, like um, even becoming aware of them all yourself. So chat feedback, this is one we're going to have a look at uh, to help with our testing. Okay, 10 minutes left. We're doing good. Um, and then finally, you can limit it to allowed domains and uh, you can also further analyze it, right? So, uh, you know, bear in mind, this is like so far, you know, and I can uh, understand how any developers in the room are going, yeah, but how do I see what's happening? You know, like I don't, I don't, you know, I need to know why it didn't work. And so there's several services and tools. Langsmith and Langfuse are the two I'm familiar with. Um, and Langfuse is actually the one I'm most familiar with. And um, basically they are an external service, which you generate an API key for, you add it to your credentials here, and you can then just turn it on uh, through here. And basically uh, that's going to act like a sort of real debug log of every question, uh, you know what's uh, you know what keywords it pulled up, what related pieces it brought up, um, how much the, it, it cost, you know, and really give you the breakdown of of you know everything to do with that conversation that you as a developer might need to be able to go. Well, I need to fix that, you know, like and also to establish like is this a problem in the data or is it a problem that can be fixed in the prompt? So that that's a good uh, segue to just mention that uh, you know there are some problems you can fix in the prompt. Um, there is a danger of overfitting the model, they call it, which is really like kind of being too uh, rigid in the prompt. But, you know, if you find that there's somewhere hidden in the tro like tens of thousands of lines of data that you've trained it on, that it should be responding a certain way and it's not, you can go in the prompt and say, hey, when they ask this question, this is the answer. And it's going to override the training. So um, it is useful to be able to kind of iterate like that if you just find some things are consistently coming through wrong and this is a quick way to fix it. Um, okay, and finally, uh, also quite uh, handy is this lead capture. So all that's going to do is put a little like when someone clicks the chatbot bubble or goes to the page with the chatbot on it, it's going to say, hey, what's your name and email? And you're going to give them your name and email and now it's going to let you use the bot. And then that's going to appear in your interface as, as leads that have uh, you know, requested this. this. So um, you, know, you can see a lot of uh, different applications for that. Uh, website assistant in the general, like, hey, just help me with content kind of thing is probably not one of them. So we're not going to enable that right now. But so let's save this. And um, now's a, a, so we can just do a quick test here. And we're going to just go and say, let's clear our, our chat history again. And we're going to say, uh, tell me about tonight's social events. Okay, so it's got it right. It's game night. And it links to the, the event page. And now look what it's doing. It's like, well, you know, it's, it's prompting us. What activities are included in Game Night? How many guests can I bring to the event? Where can I find more details about the event? So, you know, this now allows us to kind of keep this conversation going without needing to, you know, what, what else do I want to ask it or what's, what's other important information? Um, is there a deadline for registration? How do I pre-register my guests? So, you know, these are all very contextually relevant questions to, to what I just asked. And, okay, so it didn't know if there's a deadline for registration, so it said I'm going to have to think about that, but I don't know the answer. Um, why don't you know the answer yet? <laughs> We're not going to ask her that. It's just going to get in a loop. And <laughs> but what we can do is now you see these little thumbs up and thumbs down. So we can say, yes, that's great. Um, you know, excellent response. Okay. And submit feedback. And then um, is there a deadline for registration? Ah, oh, terrible. Like, you should know the deadline. And who sees those? You'll see now. <laughs> so you do. Um, or your administrator does, uh, depending on, on uh, how much access that you, you give them. So I'm just going to close that. And let's, uh, I'm just going to save that. And we're going to go up to our little cog here again, and we're going to view messages. And here it's giving us, like, great. So we've had six different messages, two feedbacks, and at the moment it's 50-50. So this is really cool in that you can kind of go through and see what are people asking it, uh, what, what frustrated them, uh, what did they lack, you know, what was correctly answered. And, you know, so it builds in this feedback mechanism that's, that's you know just a super quick way to do this. Um, you can also export this as JSON data, um, and so you know being able to sort of load that into external dashboards or that sort of thing is totally feasible. I'm sure there's an API endpoint for it too to be able to like wire it up to retool or something like that and build some nice dashboards for your client with this. But um, you know like like at a base level though, this is like feedback for free and. Um, I mean, we talked, you know, this is a goal-based agent that we've, we've been building. Um, and right now, you know, when it doesn't know, it doesn't know. But there are examples of templates where you can build like self-learning agents, where if someone says that's the wrong answer, this is the right one, it can now go, okay, cool, next time someone asks that question, I know the right answer. So that's going to be applicable in some use cases, probably not so much in a public chatbot that you don't want, you know, <laughs> random users training it on. 
Um, but yeah, so, so that's quite a powerful thing. Um, okay, and, and finally, let's, let's look at like, how do we get this thing out into the world? You know, we're ready to go. Uh, we've got good feedback on it. The client said yes. So over here, we've got this handy little embed button. And at the base level, and this is usually where I would start, um, you know, you can generate a link here. So we're going to make that public. Uh, uh, you you uh, can copy the link. And we're going to go and just paste it in a new tab. Okay, and so this is usually where I would start with sharing with the client. Because usually you're going to go through a few iterations of these. And I mean, you can see right now it's pretty bland. Um, if we look at the slide, um, you know, this, this, uh, this, ah, this was uh, the, the, the first little demo I put together where we put the logo in, we set some custom colors, and, you know, and all of that's just done through that interface. Um, but right now, you know, we can say, you know, tell us about um, the uh, end of the day tomorrow. Ah, oh, trestle us. Okay, no, that's right. right. <laughs> um, okay, well, tell us about um, other events. Okay, so the Drupal Coffee Exchange, Game Night, and so we can see this is, you know, this is working on our data set, and this is the bot we've been building. Okay, how else can we get it into things? Um, right, so, and we've got four minutes left. Uh, we'll, uh, this will be the end of this, and then we'll, we'll break for a couple of questions if anyone has any. Um, so, Generally, you want to get this on a, on a website. Here we go, you've got a pop-up HTML. So, you know, you just copy and paste that into a block. You stick that on your Drupal site. Now you've got the little bubble in the corner. It opens up. Um, if you want to uh, uh, provide some chat config there, this is what we just saw in that form. You can provide your custom uh, avatar sources, change your colors, give it an initial greeting message. You know, it would be nice to say, hey, I'm your conference assistant. How can I help you? Uh, and, you know, give a prompt for the users to, like, how, you, how they're going to be able to use you. Um, but there's a lot of other ways to do this. We could also offer this as a full page. Uh, so this could just be iframed in on a normal, on a Drupal page. Um, then, uh, you know, you've got uh, uh, React um, components, uh, both for the pop-up and for the full page. You've got uh, Python um, integration. You've got uh, just vanilla JavaScript integration. You've got basic curl requests. Um, so you can see there's a lot of different ways you can kind of get this out onto your, your different platform or, or um, site. Uh, without really a whole lot of technical expertise. Um, if you have the technical expertise, you know, that Flowwise uh, UI uh, front-end agent, um, that, that's uh, also open source, right? So you can just fork that and you can customize that however you need. You can add whatever custom functionality you need in there. And uh, that way, you know, it can be calling things within your React app and, you know, really be integrated in a way that it doesn't rely on page, like it doesn't have page refreshes and things like that. So there's a lot of great ways to kind of in include this and embed this and, um, yeah, and uh, I think the, the final slide I have is uh, just a, a quick note on that fly.io. Um, you know, this is a super simple way to deploy. Um, you know, uh, all you really need uh, is a little bit of setup involved with uh, mounting a volume and then sort of setting the volume in the fly settings. But um, other than that, it's pretty much runs on its own and you can scale it up at the, you know, to a cluster of, of machines and databases if you need to or put it all to sleep when no one's hitting it. And so, again, super low cost. This is like they give you $5 a month free, and like you actually have to really be using it to even exceed the $5. So, you know, this is pretty much just free at this point uh, if you're just using it for developer pro development projects. Um, great. So, um, I do have a link tree put together of all the links that I've talked about in this talk. Um, you're welcome to go there if you want to um, uh, access any of these tools. Um, also included in there is a, a link to the um, uh, to, to the Flowwise instance we've been using. So if you want to go and spend a little bit of time analyzing what we've done there today and messing around with it, you're welcome to clone it. I'm going to leave it up for probably a week or two after this. Um, I believe it might ask for a password, uh, a username and a password, uh, just in a sort of HD access type thing when you get there. Uh, that is grow is the username and agent is the password. Um, that's the sort of new uh, entity I'm starting to do to provide sort of uh, AI consulting and AI agent building under. Um, and I hope to have a website and sort of brand together for that soon. But um, thank you very, very much for coming. And <laughs> there was a lot of information crammed in. I hope it wasn't too much for you. And um, I'd, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. We've got um, one minute. <laughs> yes. I think I missed the stuff somewhere. So. Okay. <laughs> At least one will say. So you scraped all 100 pages, 100 whatever pages. Yes. You 
um, create embeddings, yes. write to the RAG database. Yes. And there, when someone asks a question, yes. it's not passing the entire contents of the RAG database to the LLM. No. So is, so this is kind of related to my question before, which you answered a different question, which is fine. Okay, okay. But is there a prompt to get the subset of data out of the RAG database? Well, that based on the prompt, that based on the question the person asked, and then send that as the context to the LLM for the answer to the human. I, I think that's what it is doing. Um, you know, our conversational retrieval QA chain. So this is tied to our vector store retriever, which is the Pinecone database. So, so it is kind of getting that, that vector array, and, and that's kind of then querying what, what that associated data so is. Is it, just, is it just taking what the human entered in the chat box? Yeah. Turning that into an embedding, and then, based, and, then, and then pulling out the embeddings from the RAD based on that. I, I don't believe it's, it's converting it to an embedding on the, at the question level. I think that's where it's... It's using the natural language processing ability of the underlying LLM to, to sort of infer what right. they're so, looking so for. That, that's the second prompt I'm okay. talking about. Oh, okay, okay. Right, so there has to be some way to get the, the, the subset of context out of the RAD database. Okay. That you pass to the LLM with the big prompt that you engineered. So um, I'm kind of curious about the... The subset factor. Yeah. Okay, so, um, that came about. so uh, you know, this is a, a simpler a, a example in that we have one vector database. Yeah. Um, uh, Fly, uh, I mean, Flowwise has, and let's just quickly show this templates page. Um, or it's called Marketplace, which is a bit mi uh, misleading because um, it's, it's all free. Um, sorry, maybe our VM went to sleep. Uh, oh, no. Okay. <laughs> let's see. Okay, so it might be that you have multiple vector databases. So um, context is a big issue here too, right? Like, so I uh, just use an example um, for the school district. I initially thought, great, we're going to scrape together one big blob of data for the district and for the 22 sites. And now, you know, great, we can answer anything on that. But it lacked a lot of context because if you asked about a document, it would say, yeah, sure, here's the here's a link to the document, and it would just pick a random school and like link to that. So now I'm in the process of restructuring that as a multi-agent thing where each school would have its own, um, uh, its own training set and its own agent. And when uh, the supervisor detected a keyword, which was a school name, it would just hand it over to that agent. Um, but you know, another way to do that would be to have multiple vector databases and, and you know, then put in some sort of an if-else kind of statement to say, hey, if they mention this, make sure you get the data from that database. Otherwise, we want to go into the main database. And so there are ways to be able to kind of uh, slice and dice it up. Um, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I'm not too sure why that's not. Uh, How do? Why that's How not ready? Closer to the Drupal, like this feels very kind of over over there. Like we're pulling it all out in the API. Yeah. But I've seen like the Drupal AI initiative yeah. and the like um, Solar like search API extensions. Yes. Talk to ChatGPT. Like, have you tried that part of the landscape out at all? Um, so that's a good question, and um, you know, with the AI agent stuff, firstly being so newly. Uh, um, you know, yeah. put out there. Um, I did actually start to install them locally, and then I kind of got like I was like, no wait, so like because it's kind of came out before when I pitched the session, and you know when I was giving the session. So I, I also didn't take very long to kind of realize like this is very early stages, and um, actually you know it's better to just talk about the, what what the possibilities are when that sort of yeah. matures, um, and then offer this as a sort of a stopgap until then.